On-chain Bitcoin fees have gone wild and there are over 350,000 transactions pending in the mempool or memory pool with others getting purged as we speak. What on earth is going on? How did we get here? What are the implications of all of this? Good, bad, and ugly. Is Bitcoin under attack or is there something else at play? Today we break it all down. Let's jump in. All right, so I am filming this on Wednesday, May 10th. And as we can see in this current snapshot of the mempool or memory pool, we are seeing a continuation of the recent congestion. We can see that reflected in the transaction fees, low, medium, high priority, that 415 sats per virtual byte to get yourself into the next immediate block that remains quite elevated. We'll talk about that also in a historical context too. And you can also see immediately below that something we haven't seen for a little while. You have this purging. So as you can see, the memory usage for a node is way over the 300 megabyte uh, limit there. And what that means is that any transactions that are in this case lower than 10.8 sats per virtual byte are being purged, are being dropped out. And in total, as we can see, there are 373,000 unconfirmed transactions, including about 350,000 sitting at the very tail end in these kind of lower fee transactions. Now, by the way, if some of those concepts are a little bit newer, I've done a whole video on the mempool what is a virtual byte, right? All of these different things. So I would invite you to check that out. And again, just as a simple refresher there, the memory pool is where unconfirmed transactions sit. Your node, if you're running a node, has a mempool. My node has a mempool. And so when you go to something like mempool.space, you are looking at a particular node's memory pool. Now, by way of historical context, we have seen elevated fees in the past. In fact, as recently as 2021, uh, as we can see some of those spikes there, you can see that on a just overall mempool sort of size basis, and then these different colors here represent different bands of sats per virtual byte, you can see that there certainly is a precedent. But the fact remains that fees are incredibly elevated right now, and to get yourself confirmed in the next block is definitely taking a lot more than it did just a little bit ago. So what is happening here? Well, some are calling this a DOS or denial of service attack. As we can see from this user, Bitcoin is under DOS attack. High transaction fees are the chosen pain point by the attacker, probably to make Bitcoin unusable for smaller players. Very interesting theory. And as we can see from this post from Francis at Bull, over at Bull Bitcoin, it's an interesting theory, right? If I was evil and I worked for government, you give me $10 million, I can make Bitcoin relatively unusable or certainly more unusable. I would just mint, you know, infinite shit coins on BRC20, which we will discuss, call it the free market and use that same narrative of censorship resistance free market and permissionlessness against them. It sounds logical, right? And in some ways, this is probably a more viable attack than even a 51% attack, which at this point would be incredibly difficult to accomplish. But is that what's really going on? I'm not so sure. Let's dive into what is actually happening and then we can come back to the idea of whether this is a malicious attack or not. So how did we get here? A very brief history lesson. First, we had the Taproot upgrade that activated in late 2021. Remember, this was an upgrade that was broadly celebrated by the community that would bring things like privacy improvements when it comes to more complex transactions like multi-sig. And it would also open up potentially other use cases which at the time, I don't think anyone could perfectly predict. But again, this was massively celebrated. And yet in the year plus that followed, we saw Taproot usage very, very low, right? The percentage of transactions that were using TapScript was very, very low until we had Casey Rodermore who did the first ordinals, these inscriptions on Bitcoin. Check out my video. I did an entire deep dive into that, all the sort of nuts and bolts of how that works. And so that has continued 
until we get to something called BRC20. And this is what is currently driving the congestion that we see. So BRC20 is an experimental, that's a key word, fungible token approach using ordinals. This was created by Twitter user Domo Data on March 8th. And for what it's worth, it is relatively creative. It basically uses an inscription of JSON data that includes metadata for a new fungible token to be minted, transferred, etc. So again, this is one way that you might mint tokens on Bitcoin. Keep in mind, there are many other ways. There's things like RGB. I just did a video on some of their latest releases, which are very, very exciting that I would encourage you to check out. This is something like Taro or the Taro protocol which is uh, likely going to be renamed given a lawsuit. That's a whole nother story. But I think what's interesting and what has a lot of people kind of disgruntled and upset about this is as we look at the actual documentation itself for BRC20, you can see that these will be worthless, right? So these are pure meme value tokens. And I think what's particularly unfortunate at this stage is that this current implementation, as we can see, is wildly inefficient. As folks like John Ratcliffe point out, JSON is an incredibly inefficient way to store data. And we can see Nick here confirm that, yeah, you could make this 90% more efficient using a binary encoding scheme. But at the same time, people do appreciate the human readable nature of those JSON objects. And so as an example, we can see the very first BRC20 token called Ordi. It had a limit of 1000 tokens uh, per mint and 21 million tokens total. And you've seen ordinal wallets such as Unisat. I think Unisat has by far the most trading volume. And to its credit, it is a trustless wallet in the sense that they use partially signed Bitcoin transactions to do these kind of trustless trades, which is pretty cool. But they deployed tooling and support for this, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So you have the very first BRC20 token, and there have been many more that have been created, which we will look at. And so then you have this announcement from Jack Levin, who I guess is the founder or something of Zen. I am not sure what Zen is, and I'm certainly not gonna cover it in this video, but he announced what would be called VMPX, the largest BRC20 token powered by Zen World. Again, not sure what that is. And as Rindell has done the math here, this would produce well over, you can see the update at the bottom, well over 300,000 transactions. So that is a big part of what is currently contributing to the congestion. And so you can even go to ordspace.org slash BRC20 and you can see the different tokens. There are, as of this making of this video, over 18,000 tokens created with a cumulative market cap of nearly $600 million. This is in just the last two months. So if you thought degeneracy was dead during this winter, it appears to be in fact alive and well, for better or worse. So pretty wild to see, but that is how we got here. And so let's talk now about what are the implications. Well, for one, all of this does continue to bring users into the Bitcoin ecosystem. We can see this view here from leonidas.og, the number of people who have traded on ordinal slash BRC20 keeps accelerating. And you can sort of see these kind of two distinct phases here, right? You had that initial growth just with ordinals. And then most recently that has turned parabolic once you've introduced things like BRC20. So it, you know, so for better or worse, right? These are very, very different users than hodlers or folks who want to use, you know, Bitcoin kind of every day for payments. But that does translate into the next big implication, which is fees for miners. And so we can look at this summary from May 6th. We can see in the top row, these are BRC20 transactions. And on the, on the bottom, it's non-BRC20 ordinals. And so collectively, these transactions have paid nearly 300 Bitcoin or about $9 million in fees. And this is produced, as James Lott points out, a momentous occasion. Block 788695, we actually see fees in excess 
of the block subsidies. We can see the total fees are about 6.7 Bitcoin, which is of course higher than the 6.25 block subsidy. Now for what it's worth, this has actually happened before as Mononaut points out. Um, by many times, it's, it's only 10 blocks though, uh, as far as I can tell, 10 blocks in total that this has happened. So that is a very rare event. And it certainly has some exciting implications for security budget, which we will get back to later, right? The more fees that are being paid, the more incentive there is for miners to perform honestly and all the incentives continue to work for Bitcoin's long-term security. So the bottom line, as Munib here summarizes on this point at least, is that Bitcoin fees are up 500X from just a few months ago. So let's be clear, that is a very good thing. Furthermore, there could potentially be some interesting fungibility implications as Laurent here outlines on the bright side and unexpected benefit of all these ordinal transactions uh, is that they act like pay join transactions and they are certainly ruining a part of the clustering done by chain analytics platforms. So that's actually really interesting. I have not dug into the details of that myself, but it is an interesting idea. So there certainly are some unambiguous benefits to this. However, there are also some potential downsides. For one, this definitely puts pressure on different types of service providers, particularly swap providers, right? If you're swapping from on-chain to Lightning or uh, LSPs, Lightning service providers who are providing different services like opening channels with users and things like that. Obviously channel openings and closings have to settle on chain. So you have to pay those chunky fees. And we already see evidence of that from this data from Amboss, we see channel openings declining. And so this really does raise a valid concern of would this push more people into custodial lightning solutions as opposed to using it in a self-custodial fashion. I think that's one of the bigger potential downsides and something that we'll have to simply see how it plays out. Relatedly, as Anita at Bitcoin for Fairness asks, can anyone explain how I'm going to onboard people with these fees? You know, can't use on-chain, can't open channels, makes custodial lightning the only option as we were just discussing. You know, why not use something like Liquid or RSK? We'll get to that. And so Mike in Space, who by the way, was the creator of Stamps, which arguably is a more quote unquote ethical uh, implementation of ordinals because it doesn't benefit from the witness data discount. I have not done a video on Stamps but I have done that video on ordinals if you want to listen more about that. Uh, but Anita says, I'm mostly onboarding people in Africa. They don't have the privilege like you to pay these high fees. And so it's a very good point and a sobering one, right? On the one hand, this is a free market, right? We should celebrate usage of the Bitcoin blockchain, even if it's usage we may personally not agree with. That is where I come down on all of this. But at the same time, that does have trade-offs. It has trade-offs in the sense of opportunity costs, of being able to use that block space for something else. But again, who are we to judge or claim what's a better or more moral use of block space versus others? You can see how this becomes a very slippery slope very quickly. And so is it the case perhaps that as Satoshi Takamoto says, Bitcoin is for anyone, not everyone. Okay, that's a tough thought. But again, I don't wanna just give you sunshine and rainbows on this channel. I am going to give you the full picture and have you make your own judgments about it. So what's the outlook for all of this and what are some of my thoughts on how this plays out? Well, for one, on the question of is this a fad, I think the jury is still very much out. Despite the meteoric rise of this stuff, again, we discussed these nearly $600 million market cap of these fungible BRC20 tokens and the use and the fact that usage for ordinals in general does continue to grow even though you did see a tapering of that growth rate for BRC20 it still was continuing to grow furthermore big announcement just a day ago we saw Binance come out and say that they are supporting ordinals trading in their NFT marketplace that is a humongous announcement. And so it is my belief that at least for the time being, this will likely continue to be a feature of our reality. And so therefore, what are some of the kind of knock-on effects? Because it is also true that market participants aren't stupid and it's not like they can pay infinite fees forever and ever. So I do suspect you will see improvements to the efficiency of the BRC20 implementation 
Right now, as we discuss, it is woefully inefficient. And frankly, there are just simply other better ways to do this. Things like RGB, things like Taro. Furthermore, could we see sidechains like Liquid have its moment? I've done a whole video on Liquid as well, but for those unfamiliar, it is a federated sidechain to Bitcoin that really does have some nice properties, especially in terms of privacy and potentially avoiding some of the high fees that are occurring on the base chain. But if we're being really honest, Liquid really has not seen significant usage to date. And so I think this will be a nice test for it. And really, if it doesn't pick up some usage from this, man, that is that does not look good for something like Liquid. I think a lot of people rightly point out potential concerns with the federated nature of the sidechain. You have other things like the RSK sidechain, which ecosystems like Sovereign use that I think make some better design choices. So maybe we see something spill over to that. So I'll be monitoring these different ecosystems very closely to see how the market may choose to sort of allocate this activity. But at the very least, my hope is that this is a big wake up call for the community. I think many folks, especially those that are a bit newer to the community, have been lulled by a period of relatively stable low fees. Again, maybe two months, three months from now, a lot of this has cooled off and we'll be saying, okay, maybe it was a bit of a fad, but I'm not so sure. And so make no mistake, this is the destiny of Bitcoin, right? Fees are going to get very expensive. I think a lot of people would have placed that date well off into the future, but is that date actually a lot closer to present than we previously thought? That means that these layer twos, these side chains become all the more important. And then circling back to what we were alluding to earlier, this also just has fascinating implications for Bitcoin's long-term security budget. This is, I think, one of the more common pieces of FUD that is out there today. People have moved on a little bit from the ESG FUD, having seen how Bitcoin mining can actually bootstrap new renewable energy sites and can suck up methane from landfills and all this crazy stuff. So of course, people need to recycle on to the next piece of FUD. And so they've come back to, oh, you know, Bitcoin security is doomed because fees will never make up for the subsidy, et cetera, et cetera. And we've just seen evidence that that does not have to be true at all. And so if you're not subscribed, I would encourage you to subscribe to the channel to make sure you're not gonna miss one of my next videos. Probably will try and do this next week, although I will be pretty busy getting ready for and heading down to uh, the Bitcoin Miami conference. If any of you watching are gonna be there, drop me a note on Twitter or Noster. Uh, it would be awesome to connect with some of you uh, while I'm down there. And so if the security budget video doesn't come out next week, it would probably be the week after or so. And I think, again, this is a really juicy topic right now that I think has a lot of bad takes. So be sure to stay tuned for that. With all of that, let's go ahead and conclude today's video. All right, so today we hopefully demystified what is going on with some of these fees and congestion on the Bitcoin blockchain. Really, it is these BRC20 fungible tokens. We talked about some of the implications of this. On the one hand, it's certainly good for fees. It's certainly good for miners. Uh, it's certainly bringing in net new users to the Bitcoin ecosystem. Although we saw also the downsides that does this drive more people to use custodial lightning solutions because opening and closing channels become much more expensive? It remains to be seen, but I hope you found this valuable and insightful. If you did, you already know what to do. Give this video a like, use the share feature underneath this video that really does help get this to a broader audience. And if you are so enamored by this content and you wanna to donate to a plug, which really does help me continue to make these videos, there are a number of ways you can do that. You can use the super thanks feature right here in YouTube. If you're using something like the Get Albi browser extension, you can just click that bad boy while you're watching this and send some sats that way. Or lastly, I will have my strike account and lightning address on the final screen that you will see momentarily. But for now, we'll go ahead and leave things here. As a reminder, my friends, every sat counts. And until next time, I'll see you then. Hey.